Vroom, vroom. <laughs> Right, so there we are, grey primer, almost completely flatted. Might have some paint on it today, I don't know, but we'll see. But it uh, feels lovely, you know, the old hole where the, where the um, wing mirror was is gone, and that feels really good. There's a few little places, like it's got a bit of a dink there, but, you know, if we did everything, we'd be on it forever, so we ain't going to do everything. Get it done is the thing. This is uh, the, the, the byword of this car is get it done. See this here, look, if you look, you'll notice that this has got this sort of black overspray on it, and that's just a puff, so that when you're flatting it, you don't miss anything, because unless you've rubbed that off, you ain't flatting it. It's called a guide coat. I mean, all the people in the trade know about that, but. Not everybody who watches our track channel is in the trade. So there you are, that's a guide coat. And that'll all get flatted. And we'll see. But this is one of those jobs where you say, don't want perfection, let's get it done, and I bet it turns out better. I noticed this little gap here. <coughs> and I'm thinking, oh dear, that's a little gap there. So I went and looked at the original car and it's exactly the same. Did you hear that, John? No, I didn't know that. that little, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. thought, oh, there's, there's a little bit of a gap there. We ought to try and, you know, mm. And it took some off on one side to get it in more. But yeah, but anyway, I, uh, I looked at the original car and it's exactly the same. So if we'd have gone to town on that, we'd have been spoiling its originality. But it does feel nice, and it's going to look really good under there with a coat of red on it all. And we get the engine, right? So I'm about to set about taking the engine to bits. So I'm going to take the engine out of the subframe, strip the subframe down, and then we, as we put it back together, we'll do everything. And we'll have a look at the drive shafts, because somebody mentioned drive shafts. And on the other car, I reconditioned the drive shafts myself. And I didn't think I could do it, but I did it, and I'll tell you what, it worked like a charm. So I'll show you how to do that. That, this thing, spit, was so cheap, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe you could buy so much metal and so many nuts and bolts for the money. I can't remember how much it was now, but it wasn't dear. And we've used it, Tim used it, he's rebuilding a Capri, which we've had for donkey years. Reckons he's going to let me have a go in it, so that'd be good. But anyway, we did the Capri on it, we've done this on it, you know, we've done three or four cars on it. So, um, you know, it's been an investment, really. Never had one before. I'm quite pleased with all that. See, and then that... Under there, there's had quite a bit of undersill put on it, but it's all very clean because we steamed it and we blasted it in places. So we'll just we'll just black that, you know, with the what do you call that? Shorts, isn't it, John? Yeah, like a shorts, isn't it? Shorts, and you put it in a gun and just, and then we'll have the cheap plastic edge on there because I think that's all it would have had. Um, and we've got some new bumpers, which are not right, but they're new and they're shiny and we're going to go on it. So it's all good, really. We'll have to decide what colour to have the wheels. I don't know. The wheels at the moment, we've blasted them and they're aluminium. But I don't know quite what colour to do them. Silver? Silver? Silver, gold maybe even? Yeah, yeah, gold would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll make our mind up eventually, I'm, I've no doubt. But that's, that's lovely. Lovely and solid. They're always gone there. I, I had a... Oh, what's it called? A Paul Smith Mini that was quite late. And we had to put new ones of them in. Or one side, I think, we had to do. So, you know. And that was... I can't remember what year Paul Smith Mini was, but it was quite late compared to this. 
to go when I towed my, my racing car and I was sponsored by Lions Groceries, I got a Humber Super Snipe, which was obviously one of their directors that went into the motor pool and I bought it out of the motor pool and it was sort of a dull silver colour and it had gone flat. And uh, anyway, I went to see my mate Dell, who had a spray shop, and I rubbed it down. You imagine rubbing a Humber Super Snipe down. I was a lot, like, a lot younger then. And, and, and we painted it, we repainted it black. And, um, God, yeah, I remember rubbing it and rubbing it and rubbing it. It seemed like it had gone forever. But anyway, that was another story. So doing a mini looks easy to me. The roof, I reckon the roof of the Humber Super Snipe was equivalent to this whole car. But anyway, so the next time you see it, it's going to be red. So now, we go and look at the engine. So, this is the engine. That's the rear subframe which is completely stripped, so that's ready for blasting. I'll get the radiator off, I'll disconnect the shafts and I'll lift the engine out as one lump and then I'll take that lump off there and that lump off there and then that'll be ready for blasting. And then, um, and then obviously as we put it together, we'll make sure it all goes together nicely. We'll modify the cylinder head, we'll put the twin carburetors on it um, and we'll probably put a cam. I've actually got a cam and I can't remember, David Vizard's book is a, is a good book when you're messing about with minis and, and this has got two rings on it and I, I think if I look in David Vizard's book that'll tell me exactly what that cam is. So if we think it's suitable, it just happens that I've got it. So we might put that one in and then I've got another one as well. So I've got a choice of several cams but this looks in really good condition. So. That's probably what we use, but we'll see, we'll see. Don't forget, we change our mind by the hour. <laughs> I bought that tractor from the Rag and Bone Man. It didn't go, and we got it going. That was 30 years ago, and we fixed it, and it's never missed a beat since we fixed it. It's amazing. His name was Dubber, he's dead now, but he was a local old character who used to go around to factories and get stuff and I used to buy stuff of him even if I didn't want him because I used to like to think double would come and see me first and I bought loads of tools off him bits and pieces and one day if I, he arrived with that and all this all this metal in, in here that all came from Dubber he used to come and I'm standing by myself I'll chuck out the field Dubber and he'd chuck it out the field and when I retired me and some bloke who worked with me is a really good bloke we put all this up and put a floor in I mean, it's not to build in spec, but it's done the job for the last 20 odd years. And old Dubber was the man. Here we go, look, this, hey, look, this is John enjoying himself, folks. Wow, what, what about that for a difference, eh? This is the engine out of the 59 Mini. I'm very impressed with this engine because if you look at it, it's never been red hot. It's never run out of water. Very often you take these old iron engines to bits and they've been overheated and the head has not got any paint on it because it was so hot. Well, you wouldn't get away with that with an aluminium engine, but the old BMC engine made of iron, it all cools down and goes on for another 100,000 miles. But if you look at this cylinder head, it's still got all its green paint on it, pretty intact really, and the rocker cover is in absolutely beautiful condition, you know, I mean, it's still got all its paint, that's very good, and the early type cap. So although we were going to put an aluminium rocker cover on it, I think we'll have to put that back because it is so good. So there we are, so that's the engine. We're going to take it out, we're going to modify the head slightly, we're going to put twin carburetors on it, I'll have a look in the gearbox and I'll have a look, probably put some bearings in it. But if the bearings are good, I'll leave them because there's nothing like a bearing that's done a load of miles and still in good condition. I believe it gets a thing called a Balby layer on it or something, but anyway, they'll go back if they're in good condition. Um, we won't put big valves in it. We'll just, two carburetors, 60 thou off the head. 
I bought the Clive Tricky book. One of the people, that, one of our followers said, you must buy the Clive Tricky book. So anyway, I bought it. So I'll have a read. But then again, I've also read the other book that's um, David Vizard's book. In fact, it's beside my bed. So, um, so I've read that to death. Um, but the idea is to not go too mad because it's only got single leading shoe brakes. John's making his usual noise. But he's got a good excuse this time. Um, and um, so there's no point in having 200 brake horsepower and single leading shoe brake, so we mustn't go too silly with it. But obviously, we we'll sandblast the um, front subframe and, um, and we we'll clean the engine up, we we'll paint it the right colour. This is another feature of the 59 Mini. This here hasn't got, if you, if you know minis, you'll know that here there's like an adjustment screw and the 59 never had it. So that was another bit that they worked out while the public worked out what was wrong. So it hasn't got that. So that is a 59 feature. I don't think this engine has ever been out of the car. It's, I think it might have had a new water pump, but I don't think the head's been off probably it all looks so original. So really, I'm hoping it's going to be just a bit of a clean-up. We know it's not going to have very good synchro mesh, but so what, you know? Bit of heel and toe in, a little bit of a rev up in the second or whatever, no problem. I think we'll fit a slightly larger exhaust pipe underneath and a silencer at the back, which all our followers said, you must have a, uh, what was it, a PK? P I can't remember, but anyway. If we can get one, we get one, but if we can't get one, I'm sure we'll see a picture of one, in which case we'll just make one. Um, so that's it. And then, in the meantime, the car's all been flatted, and me and Tanya will walk around there, and you'll see it's all in primer, and it's all been flatted, and we're trying to get it a bit warm, and John's going to whack the paint on it. So the next time, we'll go and have a look at it, Tanya, and then, the next time it'll be red. There it is, look. Ready for paint. Quite funny, really, because we put new ones of them on, and they're not exactly beautiful, but John managed to make the best of a bad job. And there's quite a gap just there. And I looked at that and thought, well, it's a bit of a gap. I wonder if we could do something about it. And then I went and looked at the original car and it's exactly the same. So obviously we don't need to bother. But I think that's going to paint up lovely. You know, there's a few little things. I wish we could have uh, got that dent out. But, you know, a lot of aggravation. And now John's gone this far, I don't like to say anything really, because I think it don't matter really. So that's it really, I mean I walk around it, I can't see any reason why that shouldn't look absolutely beautiful. And all that back's turned out really good. So there we are. So the next time you see this, it'll be red. And then we're going to buy a new boot. I've decided the boot is pretty rotten. And we worked it out, by the time you spent a load of time repairing it and what have you, the next thing you know, um, you might just want to bought a new one. But the only trouble is with a new one, it might not fit, but again, we can knock that into shape somehow. And anyway, the thing is, it won't hold us up because we can get on with the rest of it. And, um, and then the boot lid could be, so long as you've still got some paint left over, because they never match. But old John bought plenty of paint, I think. So we'll paint the boot lid last, if necessary. Um, but it's nothing to stop us keep going, which is the important thing. We've got to order the stuff from uh, mini spares. We've got to have a new windscreen rubber for the back and a new one for the front. We've got to have that little chrome strip, you know, the cheap plastic one, I think, round the edge. Um, what else? There was a few other bits. Oh, a new rubber grommet for there, because the rubber grommet's bound to be as stiff as stiff. So a grommet, for what it costs, is not worth worrying. Um, and it's going to be on bits that I haven't even thought of yet. But it's coming on, and I reckon we're going to get this done. It's not going to be boring, we're going to be driving this not too distant future. So I'm going to get on with the engine now, I'm going to get it all to pieces, 
um, and make a good start and then hopefully we'll have a bit of weather so we can sandblast the subframes and get them painted. Um, we won't, oh, what do they call it, powder coat. People are mad about powder coat. I don't think powder coat's particularly good. I've had things that have been powder coated and one little corner has um, got a little hole in it and the, and the rain gets in there and next thing you know you've got a patch under the powder coating which looks lovely but it's as rotten as rotten. I'm a great believer in good old chassis black. It doesn't go hard, it's sort of, it's made for the job really. Lorries have chassis black so I think we'll probably finish up with chassis black. Because, let's face it, after it's been down the road once, it ain't all going to look shiny and lovely. So, what's the point in getting keyed up? That's what I think. But anyway, but obviously before that, it will have Bonder Primer. Years ago, I had a sandblasting business, and I went to see this bloke, I think he did TRs or something, and he said, when you blast it, he said, well, put um, Bonder Primer on it. I said, what's all this Bonder Primer? He said, oh, it's the best. He said, we've done... We've done experiments with it. He said, we sprayed the door and left it out for three years and it never went rusty. So since that day, I've been on Bonder Primer. You can't buy it very easily. You have to get it online from, oh, something Voss. Anyway, we get it online. But in my experience, Bonder Primer, which is red, it goes on lovely. It is definitely the best paint to put on to avoid the rust. So coat a bond of primer, coat of chassis black, put it together. When you take an engine to bits, this is something I've learned, you know, I've been doing it for donkey's years. I mean, I don't think anybody teaches us this, but you, you know, if you've got any brains, that's what you do. I'm just gonna have to turn the engine slightly and I'm gonna need a spanner. I've had this spanner for donkey's years and it fits the front Gear. Oh, look. Can't. But when you're taking an engine to pieces, if you look at everything really carefully, now that cylinder there, look, is all clean and lovely, and that one there is got carbon on it. Now, why is that half of that cylinder like that? At this moment in time, I don't know. But it could have not a very good um, seat on the valves, so number three cylinder will be worth looking at carefully. I've also seen a leak of water. I took a Lamborghini V12 to bits once, and that was just like brand new, and it had a leak, the tightest leak in the inlet tract, and it was just obviously, I don't know why, but it came out looking like brand new. So we had 12 cylinders and one that looked like brand new. So. So that's another thing. So, you know, as you're doing it, if you take, when you take anything to bits, it's really worth, you know, looking at it carefully because it's amazing what you can learn. And sometimes, sometimes on the inlet tract, there's a famous book, I don't know what it's called, but this man worked on um, jet engines and, um, and he, when he used to take it to bits, he used to study the track and look at it very carefully and, you know, could notice that one side of the track, gas turbine engines, that's what he worked on. And um, he came up with all sorts of ideas and he wrote a book. And it's quite good, actually. And, you, you know, you can probably, well, I know you can use it when you're doing cars because there's all sorts of really good ideas in there. I forget what it's called now, but Timothy obviously has got it, and he said to me, oh, you ought to read this, Dad, blah, 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 and because I did. So it's really, really good. You won't believe it, but about half an hour ago, I had a bloke call in to see me, who looks at the channel, but he worked for me 30 years ago, and, and he came in and he said, I've got these mini bits, he said, and I can't throw them in the bin, so he dropped them off. And, and obviously we had talked to him for about an hour, but what a good bloke. And, and he does custom motorbikes. So anyway, I don't know what's in here, but he said I couldn't have better throw it away. So I'll have a look later on. But um, 
Yeah, so I'm very pleased with this. I think it's going to be really good. I don't think we're going to have to spend a load of money, which I don't... It's not really spending the money, it's having originality. I love a bit of originality. Um, and the other thing is, which this could be a good tip for everybody. I, I do that because I've got an itchy nose. I don't know why. I think it's something to do when, when I had the cancer and they did all sorts of funny things in there. But I do get this nose itch. But anyway, that's not really... Right, getting that off is impossible. And that's why very often they've never got that on there. And it's very, very difficult to do without damaging the aluminium thing. Well, I've got a system. So when we get to that point, I'll show you how we do it. And it works like a charm. So I can get that off without damaging it, and I'll show you how I do it. Now, when you take these mini engines a bit, this is the original plate, and it's an original car. You know, that plate's are precious, really, because you get a 59 Mini, the last thing in the world you want to do is to spoil the engine number. Now, every time you take this to a machine shop or wherever, they seem to take it off with a chisel. And, and I, I, nine out of 10 times, it ain't any good. So when you see these engines and they've had a skim over there, they normally haven't got a chassis plate, because it's very, di no, engine plate, uh, engine number plate, very difficult to do. So I've devised a method which has got, you get one of these sort of builders type nuts, just a square nut. It's got a bit of width, about an eighth of an inch, and it's got a thread in it. So then you measure the size of the rivet, which is seven and a half mil roughly, and then you drill a hole in it to make it bigger, and you clean a sort of countersunk bit so that the weld's got somewhere to go. And then you put that on the rivet and you knock it down so that it's as far down as you get it. And then with the MIG welder, you, you just catch that. You can't go mad, you can't, you know, because it's only made of aluminium, so you want to get it. So then you get a wet cloth, I'll go and wet this cloth. Right, so now we've welded that on there and obviously it's been red hot, so that's helped to loosen it anyway. And obviously when they bang those in, they've got a thread on them, well, a sort of thread, and as they go in, they go in right-handed. So, all you do, look, you undo it left-handed, and it comes off. And it's not damaged at all. As it happens, that rivet there has broken off, which is a bit of a shame, but it don't matter, we can get that out. And then you just very carefully, which is carefuler than that, get those out. So you put a bit of WD on. A bit rotten, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I have drilled them underneath, John, and banged them out. Yeah. That's how you get your plate off without ruining it. And we've even put this in the lathe, machined that off, and put the original rivets back. Perfect, that's that one. And as it happens, this one was obviously very rusty, and it has broken off anyway. But the main thing is, we got the plate in perfect condition to put back on there. Because I don't think we'll machine anything off there, but we'll probably do our trick of putting it on the surface table and giving it a rub with the old production paper, which gets it lovely and flat. And, and I did look to see the pistons are virtually at the top. So I don't reckon, you know, we could take anything off there worth mentioning, really, because we don't want the pistons hit in the head. And obviously you've got the gasket, but um, I think, um, I think that, uh, that will work nicely. So there you are, that's how you do that. So we're gonna have to get a rivet, because that one actually broke. 
And when you look at it, it's very rusty. And that one's a good one. And there you are, you can see, you can see the thread. So as you bang it in, it goes in like that. And it's impossible to get out. And that's the only way I've ever found. And it works like a charm. So the next thing, of course, is losing this. Because I ain't very good at looking after things. And Mary, if I get it to Mary, she makes me sign now when I take it away. But I've got this special drawer where anything I have that's like this, that's very important, before I give it to Mary to put in the envelope with the V5, I have to put it in my special place. So that's good, isn't it? So now this is gonna go in my special drawer. John bought his gun in from home. He said, your old gun's totally useless. Anyway, he bought his own gun, thank God, because it looks bloody good, doesn't it? And uh, so the next step, we're gonna do the underneath black, because we can roll it over and everything, which is good. And the floors inside, where they've been repaired, you're gonna get a bit of bonder primer, and then we'll probably paint those in with a brush or something. It don't have to be particularly, we don't want to get paint everywhere. All this bit here is all original and quite nice. And I'll tell you what, the colour don't match too bad. We had the colour match, we took, John took the bonnet to the paint people and they matched it to the underneath of the bonnet. Obviously they polished a bit of it up. And I think it looks good. And if you're gonna build a little low racer sort of mini, that's got to be the colour, isn't it? I mean, being red like that, it's got to go twice as fast as a, as a brown one. So anyway, there we are. So the next step will be rolling it on its side and doing the black underneath. But it's even got, I think it's even got a finish like a new Mini. I mean, I think if we flattered that and polished it, it wouldn't look, you know, it wouldn't look too good. I think that looks good. I think that's a good enough finish. And, and again, we're not going to spend the rest of our lives doing it because we, you know, we get fed up, really. I want to be down the road and, you know, but it's going to be the perfect little car for avoiding paying all the various things like the, mo mo what do they call it, you know, when you go into London, you have to pay the... Uh, what is it called, John? Newless. Newless. Um, and, and of course, an old car, you don't have to... You don't have to do it. So when I have to go up to Harley Street to have my treatment. <laughs> so this would be black from there. And obviously all around everywhere. But, you know, we give it a right good steam clean anyway. And John went round it with a blaster, actually. So, you know, it's pretty good, really. We had to put a new battery box in it because that was right through. And then obviously you can see the new panels in here. That's all new in there, and uh, and that's it really. I mean, all this is quite good, so we ain't got a problem with that. But it, it, it obviously had a right old under ceiling. I think that that looks an amateur job to me. I think someone yeah. did that when it was new. Yeah, just sort of. Which ain't done it any harm. It's probably helped it really, and it's all good under there. This bit here. This bit here was pretty rusty, so obviously John's made a bit up and welded that in, and a bit on the other side, because when you put the subframe in, it bolts to just there. So really, that wants to be pretty strong. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's ever so good. And of course, now the engine compartment's going to look good, so when we get the engine in, that's all going to look tiddly-poo. So I think it's good. I'm very excited about it. And that's the new bit, look. Just there. So, so John made that bit. And then this little bit here, which you can't see, 
is a boss that when the things were made, they had this sort of bit when they bolted it to something, I don't know what. But anyway, we put that back because it was there and, you know, it's all part of originality. I reckon, I reckon you could even jack it up on the original jacking point. But one thing's for sure, we ain't gonna try. Because <laughs> I know the, that looks lovely now, but you jack it up and it all goes wrong, you'll be well fed up. So that's it now, John, to mask it all up. Because we don't want to get the underseal. Have we got any of that underseal, John? I've ordered some. Ah. So we've got some coming from JR. It's just up the road from us, they're very good. You ring them up and it's, it's there in the next minute, so. It's ever so good. So, you know, although we've got loads of old junk, we don't keep a lot of stock of new stuff because you don't have to. Now that's going to look dynamite, isn't it? I'm, I'm knocked out. But we've also got a Sebring Sprite, which is going to need the same job doing. And I've got a lovely letter from the man who bought it new and ordered it with all the Sebring bits on it. And it was supercharged, and I've managed to find a supercharger. So um, there's a man, oh, he's not far from here, but he seems to know all about them, and he's got all the bits, so we'll get that done. But So, so that'll probably be one of the next jobs, really, getting on with the old Sebring. And then the Alfa Romeo, and then in the middle of it all, Samson's and whatever else comes along. But it's good fun. It keeps me going, I think, coming down here every day and being with John and Tanya and Mary and, and occasionally Susie, I think it's good for you. You've got to have a passion. So many people retire and die two weeks after they retire because they don't know what to do with themselves. I think I've always been retired, actually. I did say retired, not retarded. <laughs> But anyway, it's looking good, isn't it? I'm knocked out with that. And then we we'll put new brake pipes on it. Luckily, I've got a really good stock of proper brake pipes. None of that cunifer rubbish. If... What about that, folks? Look at that. Proper, proper steel brake pipes. I'm oh, really lucky. A mate of mine collected all that over the years and he gave it to me because he was packing up. I don't know what's going to happen when I pack up, but anyway, look, that's a knockout. So when we do the brake pipes, it'll all be done with proper steel as original, which is good, I think. Another load of old junk. I've been tidying up, actually. It don't look like it, but I have been tidying up and reminding myself what I've got because I forget what's here. So all the old shock absorbers are in there, friction shock absorbers are in there, telescopic shock absorbers are in there, gasket material is there, I've spread that out a bit more, and then down the bottom, I've had a good tidy up here. Electrical wiring, headlamps, assorted lamps, we've got all sorts of lamps in here, which obviously when you're doing the, you know, our building specials like we do, and somebody was saying, oh, you've got to have the thing that goes on the, on the gutter when you leave it overnight. Well, we've got one. In fact, I think we've got several. So we, we find the best one for fitting on the, for fitting on the um, gutter but we never use it anyway because we ain't going to leave it out overnight. I'm only mentioning it because one of our followers mentioned that. Hoses. Now, this here is quite interesting. When I go to Bewley, I see a whole box of hoses and I say to the black, how much do you want for the lot? So, I don't think I need, ever need to buy any more, but when you're doing a car, a special again, like we do, because we're always making stuff, and you need a bend like that, perfect. So... So I've got a lot of them, you know, that's a really, you can't believe how useful that is. Like even Timothy comes down and uses that, so when they're doing Bugattis, he wants one that goes from a, a smaller size to a bigger size, and in amongst this lot somewhere, there is one of those, there's another one of them lot. Another 
See, now that's a useful hose, that, because it's got a bigger size there, a bit of a bend, perfect. So that's another good one. And then we've got some big ones, which we'll probably never, ever use, but you never know. We might put a, a monster supercharger on something, and it could be useful, but anyway. You see, again, heater hose type hoses, little hoses. So that is a must, that. And then obviously we've got a straight tube, which I go and buy from Spectrum Hoses. This has got all lumps of rubber in it. Over the years, you know, you're making a windscreen and you get a metre of it and you don't use it all. Now, obviously having a little short bit's not necessarily any good, but you've got the section and you try it and you think, oh yeah, that's just what we want. So then you go in the book and buy some. So that's that. And then in there's another load of rubber. In there is brake cables, and in the end there, that's all leather straps and bits of old junk. So, you know, when we're doing these specials, this is all Climax here, because I've got my Climax Lotus 7, um, and I've got quite a lot of Climax stuff. Competition clutches, again, you know, every time I see something like that at Beaulieu or somewhere, I think, oh, that don't look dear, and I buy it. It's amazing how often you use it. That's all bearings for climaxes. Diffs for um, A-series, which is useful for the A30, the Lotus 7, and, um, you know, just useful diffs then. Now, this is the point where I haven't tied it up now. This has all got to go. I'm going to go through that lot. Hoses. That's a useful box. My, one of my mates, some races, a two-litre... No, it's not a two litre rod, it's a national hot rod. And when he's doing all the thing, he borrows that from me, because he says it's all very well looking on the thing and ordering them, but to have it there is very useful. So he's, he's probably had more use out of that than me, but that's all the fittings there. But then again, you know, he has a few out of it and then he puts some back. Never use that, I think that's a dry connection. Have a look at that, Tanya, because that is a very useful load of stuff if you're building a hot rod or something. And that's it, really. Distributors, spark plugs. Oh, that's another useful box. Rubber mountings. Bump stop rubbers. Now, engine bearers. But when I used to race the Capri, I used to never put the... Um, or anything I race, I never put it on with anything other than engine mounting. So I used to reckon if an engine mounting is going to hold it, an engine, then it must be able to hold an exhaust pipe. And I never had an exhaust pipe fall off. Very often you see racing cars dragging exhaust pipe. Yeah? Yeah. previous um, episode of this we made up a thing to be able to get the plate off there and I welded things on you'll see that but anyway this one was actually broken and we hadn't realized I mean I did it all and it just fell out now to put that plate back nicely with the two rivets I'm gonna have to get that out well that's in there I can tell you because getting them out the clever way is hard, without having a top on it, it's impossible. And you never drill it out, because it's really hard. So I want to knock it out, and I've done this before. So what I've done is, I've put a square on it, and got it dead lined up with a hole, put it on there, and then I've lined this up, and then I dot punched it. Bosh. Now the thing is, is this is a bit of guesswork, really. but. What I've got to do, there's plenty of room here, there's no way it's going to go into the water, there's plenty of room. But obviously I want to be on the end of that so I can knock it out with a punch. So I'm, first of all I'm drilling an eighth hole. Now normally I would do this with an electric drill, because I hate these <coughs> they drive me mad. But anyway, I'm going to have to use this because I'm 
I'm sort of judging the angle, and I'm reckoning that's about right. So I'm now about to drill. Now you're not going to want to listen to this for the next five minutes. So that's it. Once I start drilling, we'll stop filming, and then and then we'll see how clever I am with whether I've got it in the right place. Well, it feels like it's breaking through something. Now I can feel that's hitting the bottom of the river. Because that ain't going nowhere. So, looks like I might have cracked it. Might have to drill the hole out a bit, but we'll see. Anyway, let's see whether I'm lucky. Well, you ain't going to believe this. I can't believe it myself. Come round here, Tanya. Look, there is the old rivet. What a bit of luck, eh? But you can see, with that spiral on it, that would be very in there. You'd never get that out, and that's done it. So put a little bit of body filler or something in there but it's no it can't get into the into the uh, you know into um, into the waterway now the next one and this has come to pieces is absolutely beautiful the bearings are so lovely piston rings are a little bit worn I think we might replace a couple of the compression rings but we don't want it to be tight we want it to be like an old mini that we're tweaking up but the only problem is, sometimes these rust from the back. And it's all so lovely, I love to touch them. But that one could be the rustiest one. So I think I might take that one out. Bash a hole in it, get it out, and have a look. So that's the next job for this. If you hang on just a sec. Oh. Should just come out though, because you know we bashed it the other way, so there you are. But you know, I don't think, I think, um, see, look at all that in there. Look, so anyway, you've seen doing that one, it's pretty hard, you know, and the good thing is. When we're cleaning that out, we can clean it out a lot better. So I think that one's going to come out, that one's going to come out, and then there's one on the back of there. So we might as well take them all out, clean them up, mini spares. If I haven't got them, mini spares or someone will have them. So that's I've taken it. all the cord plugs out, and they all look a bit rough. So that's that. Now the next thing is, is the main oil gallery, which goes right the way through there. I think it was drilled originally. And I always like to look in them because they always get dirt at the end of them. And this engine, the big ends just look fabulous. They're definitely going to go back. They're beautiful. Um, and so, really, we've got to take the main oil gallery plugs out so that we can look inside there. And what it is, it's just a brass plug that somebody in the production line just hammers in, done. So, obviously, there's no easy way to get it out. So what we do is we set the punch the centre like that, get the drill. Drill a hole through it. Find a suitable bolt which I've found, 
I'm looking a bit slick here because I've done the other end, but anyway, that's not really there. So get a socket because that's then bigger than that. And then you've got a threaded bolt with a washer. So the next thing is you've got to put a thread in there. So as it happens, quarter UNF is common and I've got a common UNF tap. So what we do, we just... By the way, this tap wrench belonged to Jack Lemmer Burton. When I bought some tools from somebody who knew him well, this came in amongst it. It's a lovely, lovely thing, because it, it's, you know, it's just a lovely thing. So old Jack knew what was good, because he had more bent Bugattis than anybody had ever had. So every time I use it, I think of old Jack. I didn't know him very well, but I went to his funeral and I met him. I met him a few times and managed to look after him a little bit because, you know, he, uh, we, I gave him a lift once on a rally. It was something to do with launching the VB110. Poor old Jack needed a pee. Now I'm 80 and I know how he felt. So I found him a toilet, which was good. Right, so now we've got the threaded bolt, the socket, put that in there, screw that in, and then turn the bolt. As you can see, it wouldn't fall out. Because the fact I've done the other end, I could have put a, I could have put a bar and bashed it out, but I thought, well, you might like to see this. Because not everybody in the world, you know, mucked about like I have all my life. So them little tips might suit, help somebody. And there you are. It's pulled the plug out. And if you come here, and if you could shine a light down there, that would be very informative. See that there, look? Right at the end there, look. That is dirt. Now, you try and get that out, you'd be struggling. So you don't want that, because now we've disturbed everything, all those bits of loose stuff will finish up going down the oil ways before they get to the filter. And, of course, then... It's just going to um, finish up on the big ends or the mains or somewhere and it'll look bloody awful. And it'll, you know, so this is such a lovely engine, we're going to have to be careful to make sure we put it together as good as what it already was. We don't want to make it worse, because now I've got that stuck in there, haven't I? But anyway, I'm sure I can hold that with a pair of pliers and get it out. Anyway, so that's that. So the next thing, I think... I should just steam clean this, but really it wants hot tanking. So I think we might have that done. Because, you know, it really does get in there and gets it very clean. And that, I will make up a piece of rod with a bit of emery cloth and I will polish that out before it goes for hot tanking. So when it comes back, we haven't got to go down there with anything. Because you don't want to be, you know, putting dirt in it again. So that... We'll make a little film of that and um, and then I'll steam clean it and then it'll go off probably to Payne's because they're near us and um, I think they actually pick stuff up which would be a lot easier than having to take it. So that's what we do. Right, that's the little plug that we took out. You saw me take that out. So that's that. So now the oil gallery is right the way through. Now I'm going to send this away and have it tanked. So they put it in a lot of caustic mixture and it really gets it clean. But nevertheless, even before I do that, I always like to run something right down the main oil gallery, just so that I know it's lovely and it'll only get better, not worse. So what I do is you get a bit of rod like this and you get a hacksaw and you saw a little cut in it there. So you put that in there like that, just a bit of emery cloth. And then the drill goes that way, so you wind it up like that. So 
So that's it. I think that'd be about a fit. Because it is counterboard for the... Right. So... So that just goes in. And you go all the way down and out the other side. So when we have it tanked, it can only get better. But if there'd have been any burrs or little bits and pieces in there, there's a good chance that that would have took it off. So, you know, and it's quite good for all sorts of things. So, you know, listen, all the people in the trade know about that, but there are people watching this who probably think, oh, that would be really good for cleaning my whatever. And it works like a charm. I've used it so many times on all sorts of stuff, you know. But, uh, so there we are. That's it, done. So that's it now. I will put this in the safety clean machine and give it a clean off just so that it don't make your hands filthy dirty. And, and then possibly even steam clean it. And then I'll get on to somebody who does that tank cleaning and get it taken away and tanked. So that's that. So the next thing will be stripping the head down and we'll discuss what we're going to do to it because we're not going to go mad. Um, and, and it does make a difference because I've done it a million times. But, you know, you can spend your life polishing cylinder heads and all that. I'm, I'm not into that really. But I know the bits that I've done over my lifetime that I know make a difference. So um, so we'll do the head next. Right, so you've seen me do the main oil gallery with the thing going right the way through. So the next thing, put it in the safety clean and you wash it all off and you get a file. Well, I have a file like that. Look, it's a bendy file. Because I don't want to file the whole thing. But where the, where the studs have gone in, there's always a burr. So if you can just ease that off. You know, you don't want to file all over everything because obviously it'll ruin it. But, and very often, sometimes the edges are a bit, this is a good engine because I don't think it's ever been to bits. But very often people price the head off, which, you know, let's face it, you have to do. And then the edges get a bit blurred. So, you know, you can check the edges, you go along the edges. And when I'm saying this, I mean all over, all around there, all along the sump, everywhere. I go over it with this and just... You know, take the burrs off. If it's a bit... You see, that's quite... That, where that comes through is quite... Uh, but you do it in the safety clean machine or you do it with paraffin or something, I don't know. But, you know, you don't want to touch that bit there because obviously that's very important. You don't want to file that. But where the, where the um, studs come through, it don't do any harm to just give that a little rub. And then on the sump as well, I do that. And then the next thing is you've got to, you've got to deglaze the bores because the piston rings won't bed in or they'll take a long time to bed in. So you've got to deglaze the bores. And I've used these things. I find they're absolutely magic. You put it in there. Put the safety clean on. Run that in there. Get it nice and wet. And then it's in like that. Perfect. So that's how I do that. And then, the other thing is, obviously, the main oil gallery sends oil up to the main bearings. So you can have a selection of these things, which I can't ever remember buying them, but I have bought them in the past, and I've got quite a few of them. And you, um, and you give all the all of them are rub. And then there's another one that goes across to the main, to the camshaft bearing. So you give that a rub. And you give them all a, a good, you know, good rubbing, because you're going to look in them anyway once you're done. And again, you see, along that face there, I've done that now, but those are sticking up like a loony, them, where them um, drillings are. And there was a couple of little burrs on the edge, which I just rubbed off. So that's all you do with that. So you're going to poke them in. You've done the main gallery. 
you're going to deglaze the bores, um, and then we were going to send it off to my tank. But I've changed my mind because that was an hour ago. I think I'm going to really clean it up and then I'll steam clean it like a loony and see what it looks like. Because all of that sending things away it all turns into the lay. And the other little thing I was worried about is the camshaft bearings. I don't intend replacing them. And I think that caustic stuff sometimes attacks the white metal. So that's another reason not to get it tanked. So anyway, we'll see how we get on after we've steam cleaned it. Because steam cleaning is wonderful. Because, you know, you're cleaning it in here. There could be dirt in that. So that ain't no good. But steam clean, you've got pure water coming out like a loony. Um, and it ain't taking any grit with it or anything. It might be a bit of grit that it's washing off, but you can't off get some stuff off with a steam cleaner. And I think, to be honest, that would be good enough. But you've got to be careful, because this engine is so good. I don't want to put it together and, and, and the big ends all get marked with dirt, because it's managed to come all this time, 100,000 miles nearly, without the big ends just look like perfect. So... Um, so that's it really, I'm going to keep on doing this, I'm going to see what it looks like and if I can avoid sending it anywhere I will, because I want to get this done. Old John's getting on with the body so good and um, next thing you know if we overtake the mechanical side so we've got to really have a go. Because he'll help me obviously with the mechanical side because he can do it just as good as I can. Um, so that's it really. Right, this is the cylinder block, I've thoroughly cleaned it. I took the bungs out, which you saw for the main oil gallery and any other bung that I could. Took all the um, car, um, car print bosses off. In other words, they call them freeze plugs, but they ain't. It's to hold the cores up when it's cars. But anyway, we took all them out. Got to get some new ones. Although I've got bundles of them, obviously I haven't got one the right size or th four the right size. Right. And when it was together, I measured how far down the bores were. The pistons were down the bore. So I reckon we've got a scope to take a whisker off here. Now, I don't think we're cheating, because the bloke in 1960 could have easily gone down to his machine shop and said, can you take 10 thou off of there? So, but the thing is, I'm going out to get some compression, because modern fuels are good. Even the ones they don't reckon are good, as far as I'm concerned, seem good. So obviously you've got to be really careful because you could take a lump off of there too much. So John's been super careful. But he's just took a cut over there with no cut. And it's took a little bit off down that edge and it's took a little bit off down that edge. So that means that over the years this casting's probably settled down. Because I can remember when I was a kid and I wasn't driving or anything and we'd go by the old AEC factory where my dad had worked during the war. And out in the field, there were hundreds of cylinder blocks. And uh, my dad pointed to him and said, see all that lot in the field? He said, that's cylinder blocks. He said, after they cast, they put them out there to normalise and settle down. So I never forgot that. So I reckon that this old block has settled down a little bit. It's a little bit like that. So we're going to take 10 thou off it. Now, I reckon you need about 30 thou clearance between the head and the piston because obviously when it all heats up and when it's revving it all stretches and on my climax engine the first time i built one it didn't leave enough clearance because you want to get some compression on a climax and the pistons just kissed the top and that was about i think i left 25,000 and i really should have left 35,000 so that's what we're aiming at because the gasket is i think 35 thou thick. So even if the pistons were flush, you put the gasket in, they're still not going to hit the head. So anyway, so old John's going to take between 10 and 15 thou off of there. Um, and again, it's very difficult to do it accurate on this sort of machine. This old uh, skimming thing here, we made this. We bought the, the harbour at Bewley and then we bought a big lump of metal and we've experimented with tips quite a bit, but old John has found that this tip here with a hardening works the best. Now again, if that's not totally smooth, it's not a bad thing. If you had the super ground surface on there, 
It may seem, it may look lovely, but a few little marks helps to hold the gasket. So, you know, if it's got like a little bit of a groove, when you bolt the head down, the gaskets are so, stop it going like that. So, that won't be a super shiny finish on there. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what you want. So that's what's going to happen. And that will bring the piston still down the bore a whisker. But you put the gasket on and of course it'll be down the bore a lot. And we don't want to take too much off the head because the minute you start thinning the head down, you could run into gasket trouble. But the head, you could definitely take 60 thou off it without any worry. So if we take 60 thou off there and 10 thou off of there, that's 70 thou. But we're going to alter the combustion chamber, which is going to lower the compression again. So, you know, you can only do your best to get in the middle of it all. So how much is that, John? Five pounds. Five pounds. I reckon that'll clean up, probably. Now you can see what I mean about taking the plate off that's got the number on. The minute you do this, you've got to take it off. And getting them rivets out is a nightmare. The plate's made of aluminium, so the minute you start banging anything, the plate gets destroyed. So that little tip of unscrewing them really works. So when this is done, we will put the plate back, because it's a matching number car, so we don't want to lose the plate. Nice finish for the head gasket. Yeah, I reckon that's really good for the head gasket point of view. Okay, fifteen hundred quid for this milling machine. Bought it for a man in Devon. Went down there with a young bloke called H who used to work with me. We put it on the car trailer, we swiveled the head round, tied it down, and I must say I was a little bit worried about getting stopped, but we never saw any policemen anyway. So the next thing we had to get it here. That was a drama, but we managed it. And, and the man I got it from, it was his first machine. He had a lovely machine shop. And he had loads of machinery, his CNC stuff and all that. And he just didn't have room for this. Look, I tell you, when we took it away, he was almost crying. He said, oh, that was my first machine. I earned a lot of money on that machine, he said. And, um, you know, it was really nice. And it wasn't a mark on the bed. Nothing. Never touched the bed ever. And, you know, neither have we because I'm really appreciating the thing and I don't want to spoil it. So the next person who finishes up with this machine, I hope they don't mark the bed. Well, that looks good, doesn't it? I'm knocked out with that. And five thou has, has cleaned it all up. So it wasn't that bad. I must say that thing whizzing around frightens me though. You certainly don't want to get near it. Now this is where you wind it up to take it off. What's that, John, a number five? Yeah. Right, so this is the head off the mini. Put my fingers down the holes, I'll tell you why, it feels very good. I think the pattern making on this engine was very good, because obviously what happens with cast iron it has a pattern, and the pattern has to line up nicely with the machining, which is very rare. Very often there's a, a dodgy old edge in there because the pattern wasn't accurate enough. But the patterns for this cylinder head must have been marvellous because they're very good. There's a very nice radius there. So I don't think actually inside the ports we're going to do anything. So what I've done is I've got the heads, I just happen to have a Mini Cooper S head, this is a head that they recommend, I forget now, it's got a number, but anyway, it's a very good head apparently. 
So what I reckon is, I think the answer is in the combustion chamber more than anything. So what I'm going to do, if you look at this cylinder head, around the inlet valve is laid back. That little pip has taken off and blended in, and then round the exhaust is laid back. So I reckon that that will be where the power is. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to modify one of them, and then I'll make a template to fit that one, and then I'll put it on them and do the same. Now the other thing is, is that hole there. Now that lines up very nicely with the aquaplane manifold, so that's all right. But I think we can make it slightly bigger inside. Not much, just a bit, because again, remember we're supposed to be a bloke in 1960 in his shed, tweaking up his mini, and he ain't got a lot of machinery. He's got a drill and a few bits. He's had a bit taken off there. He's going to have 60,000 taken off there, and he's going to put a cam in it. Well. Obviously you could go and buy cams, but I've got some cams and I've got cams from a later engine and I don't want to spend any money. So I put the engine, the cam from a later engine, which has got two circles on it. And I've got the David Vidal book, so I'll try and look that up and see which car it comes out of. But it'll be better than the cam that's in there, because that is very mild. And then we'll take 60 thou off of there, same as what we've done there. And, um, and that would be the head done. And then I'll look into valve springs. As it happens, the valves are lovely, so we just clean them up. And what I've done, I've got a couple of old valves, and I've machined the heads off them, so that when you drop them in there, it protects the valve seat. Because you start branching and grinding in there, and you touch the valve seat, Obviously then you've got to recut the valve seat and then the valve goes in further. All sorts of problems. So, protect the valve seats. I'm going to clean that bit away, make a template, do them all. Then we'll have a look at valve springs. Because again, I don't want to put valve springs in it that are ridiculously hard. I mean, if this car bounces its valves at 6,000 revs, that'd be fantastic. So, um, I think in David Vizard's book, he reckons that the standard valves bounce at five something. So anyway, it's all a bit technical. I don't think we want to get too carried away with all that. So we'll do that little bit there, and we'll do that little bit in there. And then when it's all going on the road, and we drive it up the road, and it's no faster than the standard car, we just say, well, we ain't so clever as what we thought we were. But we'll see. I think that it will be definitely quicker, rev a bit freer, not going to touch the crankshaft, the crank's lovely, the bearings are lovely. And then the piston rings, I'm going to do a real old bodge on them. And, and I know all the people in the trade and all the people who know about things will all be laughing. Like they'll probably be laughing about this. But anyway, if I hadn't have done so many races in my life and done so well, I wouldn't have the confidence. You know, I'd be going, oh no, it's all got to be new and you've got to have this and you've got to have that. I reckon we get away with the right old shed racing bodge up and this little car will go very well. And we'll see. And we ain't going to spend a load of money. So that it holds the gasket and stops the gasket. No, it's lovely. And the bores were good. That little bit of a lip on the floor, but I'll rub that out. Because we don't want the piston ring hitting it, but I, I don't think it will. No, I think that's all good. Another five, and that's it. And I can always rub a bit off the pistons if I have to. That ain't difficult.